course it is Drupal 7 if you've done it. Um, and the plugin system is one of my favorite subsystems in Drupal 8. That's kind of become my pet project. Um, and I think it's really cool because it saves everybody a lot of time. Um, so let's go through that. Um, before we start, of course, what, what are we talking about? What are plugins? Um, kind of in the context of Drupal and in most uh, development contexts, we consider plugins to be swappable extensions, and they provide logic for a specific set of tasks, or just one task. Um, so not like a module, which is also kind of swappable, but it can do anything. A plugin is really meant to do one particular thing. It is of a particular type, so there's a block plugin, there's a field format plugin, and a field format plugin only formats fields, it doesn't do anything else. It's a really small, self-contained, specific piece of logic. We can uniquely identify plugins. So if we have a plugin, we know what it is, we know its name, we can look it up later. Uh, and once we have a name, we can, we can create a new plugin. Um, so, once we have something in this part of the system, we can recreate a plugin later. Uh, plugins have metadata. Um, they don't really have an ID, they're, they're not just classes. Um, they can have all kinds of static metadata for us um, to know more about them, to expose themselves to the system, like a human readable label, maybe a description, a few URLs of configuration pages. Um, there's all kinds of stuff that you can add. It doesn't have to be the same for every plugin. Um, so they're very open about themselves. And this is one of the most important things. Um, we can have multiple instances of the same plugin. So if you have like a search form block in Drupal 8, which is a plugin, we can have multiple instances of those. We can have multiple search block forms on the same page at the same time, and they behave, they behave differently. They're still search forms, but they are their own unique little things. And we know a lot of these concepts from earlier Drupal versions. Um, well, this is the dreaded hook system in Drupal 7. Um, most plugins uh, or extensions for Drupal 7 were discovered through hooks, even though we didn't actually call them plugins. Um, a, a good example would be the field system, the field API plugins, so field types, field widgets, field formatters. They're all discoverable through hooks as a Drupal core pattern. Um, but the hooks are not really nice for several reasons. Um, we're not going to discuss those right now. Um, look them up, hooks versus events. Um, another discovery mechanism that we use in Drupal 7 was file-based. So if you have ever written C-Tools plugins, you have to have a file in a particular place that exposes an array of metadata, which is a completely different way of exposing and finding plugins than using hooks. Um, this might actually be the worst one, black magic. Um, even, even the field types in Drupal 4, they use a lot of magic functions, callbacks, hooks that aren't actually hooks because they're only invoked for the one module that provides the field type. So it's not actually a hook, it's really just a magic callback that abuses the hook system. But it's magic, it's, it's, it was initially not that well documented, it's a little more better documented now than it used to be, um, but still it's spread out across the system. There's a hook implementation here, there's a fake hook implementation there with a the callback stuff like up and down. Um, it's not really easy to find. And only some plugins are classed. Like I said, a lot of these callbacks and hooks were scattered across the system in include files or the module files. Um, only a very few select plugin types, like the ones used by views and sequels, they're classes. They have everything together in one class, which is very nice. But we only did it in Contrib for a few plugin types. Very confusing, all these different ways to discover plugins, to create new plugin types. Um, so we did something about that in Drupal 8. Um, we have a plugin system now, which is all unified and nice and pretty and gives you all a warm, fuzzy feeling inside. Because every single plugin is always a class. All functionality that a plugin needs is inside its own little class. Which is nice, because you can keep it all together, you can move it around, you can re remove it all at the same time. And if you look for a plugin's functionality, you know where to find it, because it's all the same place. Um, this is a PHP uh, object-oriented programming thing, or not even PHP, but they implement interfaces. And an interface is really just a blueprint of a class which defines what kind of methods a class has, what arguments it takes, and what output it returns. Um, which is really cool, because it doesn't enforce you to use a particular implementation. A class has method bodies. It already does the thing that it's supposed to do, but an interface only defines, like, oh, return a build array with a form. How you build the form, I don't care. Just give me a form. And then a class implements that method and then actually figures out how to build the form itself. Um, 
So if we create a plugin type and it has an interface, we only tell the system, or tell developers really, if you want to write a plugin for this type, it has to provide this functionality. How you do it, we don't really care. We don't want to know. It's your freedom. Just make sure that you provide this functionality. And we have a really consistent API for discovering plugins, for creating them, regardless of the type that these plugins are off, whether they're block plugins or field type plugins or whatever custom plugin you create in Contrib. There's a consistent API for finding out about these plugins and working with them. So no more dark magic. It's all defined, it's all very explicit, but it gives you a lot more freedom than you had before. So again, before we go on, um, a couple of terms and phrases and names that you need to know. So the first thing is a plugin type. What, what is a plugin type? A block. Block's a plugin type. Um, a field type, or a field widget, field formatter. Those are three plugin types. Um, what else do we have in core? Image formatters, image styles, whatever they're called. They're plugin types. We have, we have a couple of dozen of these plugin types in core, and they all were designed for a very specific set of features or of tasks. And every plugin for a plugin type has a definition. A plugin and a definition are kind of the same, but like they're two parts of a whole. You can't have a plugin without a definition, and the plugin definition kind of defines the plugin, because the definition also contains the name of the class that the plugin is, is to serve. And the really cool part about this is that you can reuse a class, because the plugin definition is the canonical source of information about a particular plugin. You can have two different plugin definitions that both use the same class, that's fine. Yeah. So logically, they use the same logic, but because the metadata from these definitions is different, and this metadata is injected into these classes when you instantiate the plugin, the class can behave differently based on this static metadata, based on its ID or maybe uh, a true or false flag in the metadata. Um, but the logic is all the same. We use that, for instance, for uh, menu links because we have default classes that we reuse all over the place. We have like one menu link plugin class, but we have dozens or hundreds of definitions. And these menu links logically we have the same, but because the definitions are different, you get a different menu link. The second or third concept really is plugin discovery, because it's great, you know, you're a developer, you want to extend more or another module, you create your plugin, but how do you discover this? Well, we actually call this discovery. Um, it's basically the act of finding out, like, given a particular plugin type, which plugins do we have of this type. Um, once you know about that, okay, you're a little ahead, and then you want to actually work with these plugins, or maybe you're like, oh, you know, we have these 20 block plugins, I want to use the one of them. So you want to create an instance of it. That's plugin factory. You factor, you, you make you make things in a factory, really. So you make an instance. Um, and these two things, these discovery and factory patterns, are combined in what we call plugin managers. And a manager is a really, really bad thing, um, technically speaking, from you know, software design. But this is a really cool thing, because using a plugin manager, we can find plugins and we can create them, basically do everything we want. Discovery and factory and the plugin managers, they're interfaced. They have PHP interfaces with specific methods and return values. So once you can work with any or one discovery method, you can work with all of them. You just need to get the plugin manager, and then regardless of the type, you can find and instantiate plugins. And the plugin manager really just combines discovery and factory in its own class, adds a few little extra features for default values and stuff. Um, nothing really more, it's mostly a convenience thing. The real logic is in the discovery and factory classes. So we've got the factory. Like, we want to create a plugin instance. So we get one. And a plugin instance is an object. It's an instance of the class of the plugin. The factory injects the definition into the plugin so it knows more about itself. You know? It's basically, whenever you, it's like when you're born, you get an identity card that has your name on it, the date of birth on it, and your social security number is like a few. A plugin can get its own ID card and be like, oh, this is me. That's basically a plugin definition. Or um, a plugin instance. So the definition can control what a plugin does, or a plugin instance does. It is injected into the plugin, but it's a definition. It is, once the definition is created, it is the same. If you create multiple instances of the same plugin, they all receive the exact same definition, and they're different objects, so they can still lead different lives, but these definitions are the same. You can't change it after you've instantiated the object. But if you do want to change something, that's when we use plugin configuration. Configuration 
can be changed whenever you want during the lifetime of a plugin instance. Um, so if you want to change its behavior, so the definition is, is more like identity, and configuration is solely the behavior of a plugin. If you want to change that during its lifetime, it's fine. There's an interface for this, a configurable whole plugin interface. Um, and you can import and export the configuration array of the plugin, and you can store it somewhere. Um, use cases a little later. Um, so these two things are different. Definition is identity, don't change, configuration, whatever the hell you want. And using this configuration, here's the uh, interface of this Using the configuration and the plugin ID, um, you can recreate a plugin in most cases. Um, you need to know the plugin type, which in Drupal Core basically means you have to have the plugin manager because we have no discovery for plugin types in Core. There's a module that does it, but not in Core. So once you have the manager and you have the ID and the configuration, you can recreate a plugin instance that should behave pretty much the same as the other one. Depends a little on how the plugins have been built, but in most cases this works. So if you have a plugin instance, you call the get plugin ID method. You get the plugin ID. You, get, you call the get configuration method. The, the, the configuration, and you store these in a config file or in the database, whatever you want. And then maybe a day later or on another page, you want to recreate this plugin because the first time you used it was in a configuration screen. Like you were configuring this plugin, and then on the front end for the visitor of your site, you want to reuse it. So you grab this ID, you grab the configuration, and you pass it on to the factory of this plugin manager, and you you get a pretty much identical plugin. So discovery is one of the fundamental parts of the plugin system. One of these universal APIs that we redesigned you know, to get rid of all the books and the file discovery and all that. Um, and it's not just a fancy space shuttle, um, but there are actually a couple of different methods that are available. And you can create your own discovery methods as long as you implement the discovery interface. interface. Um, the most important one in core is for annotated classes. And an annotation, um, even if you don't know the name, I'm pretty sure you know what it means. Have you ever seen documentation blocks in PHP code with a little words in them, prefixed with an at sign, like an at sign and an evil address, like at param, at return, at var? Those are annotations. Um, they're widely used um, to add static metadata to PHP code. And these are used for documenting a method, but we also use them in PHP unit for uh, marking code covers, like app covers, and covers default class, app data provider. Um, so when we do work, use this for plugins, we basically have a plugin class, and then above that we have a documentation block with an at sign with the name of the plugin annotation, like at block or at image style. And then we have in the code comments an array with the static metadata, with the name, with the ID, and a few other things. Um, and the really cool thing about this is that you have your static metadata, your plugin definition, that's, the, that's what's in the doc block, together with the logic. And this is really useful if every plugin really just uses different logic, if every plugin just has a different class anyway. Because you can keep your plugin's identity and the plugin itself, you can keep everything in the same file. So you can move it, you can remove it, just the one file. You don't have to do work in two different places. If you go to the one file, all your documentation on that plugin is right there. The other one that we use in Core is YAML Discovery. And this is mostly because we have some plugin types that, like the menu links that I told you about, that use the same class, use the same logic. Because a menu link, one, you know, all menu links in Drupal Core are exactly the same apart from the path and the um, URL and you know, the access stuff, um, which is all defined in this static plugin definition. So in order not to have to create new class files with classes and subclass everything without actually changing the class body, we have YAML discovery. So in the root folder of your module, for the plugin types that use this, there's a YAML file, and which is basically a very readable array structure. Um, you key it by plugin ID, and then you have a short array with the metadata. Um, and in most cases, the, the name of the class that should be used is merged in by the plugin manager. So, and I'm going to show you this in a code example in a while. Um, you get really small definitions, but it's really, really easy to add more definitions while reusing the same logic, um, which is what we want when we create a new manual link. We don't want to change any logic. There's static discovery. Basically, it's a discovery class. You have set definition, get definition, um, useful for testing if you have 
testing definitions that you just simply want to inject somewhere and you don't want to have fancy discovery that is extensible for other developers because it's one tiny isolated test. We still have hook discovery, technically in core. I don't think we use it anywhere anymore. You shouldn't. But it's still there because we were in code freeze and we couldn't remove it. Um, but this very nicely illustrates that the system is very flexible and are abstract because all these four methods, they all, they're all classes. They all implement the same discovery interface of the plugin system. But they do completely different things. Yet, because they implement the same interface, every piece of code can use them. Every call of code, it doesn't care what they do internally because they still have the same get definition, get definitions methods. So this is an example of annotated class discovery. Um, can we increase the contrast, maybe? Is there someone who can do that with the projector? Probably not. Can you read it in the back? No. Is, is it readable, the dot block, this part? No. No? no? Trying to fix it. I blame the reveal JS syntax highlighter. Nothing? Okay. You can change the color with the D1. Yeah, um, then I have to really quickly dive into the code. Um, can we turn on the lights? Yeah. That will probably help. Um, right, because this is, I am fairly new to reveal. So. <laughs> Um, it's a web page, it's not a static slide, which is fun. So this is basically the doc block here. Well, you know, see there's a nice little description like we usually use. Um, in-group is an annotation, not for plugins, but we basically say this piece of code is part of this, this group. Uh, this is the actual annotation, and you see here, at views display. So this is actually a copy of a real views display plugin from core. And, um, Every plugin type has, that uses annotations has its own annotation class. And this one has a views display class. And we basically, we see here an associative array with a couple of keys and then the value. So this is, this is a Boolean flag. This is a human readable label. And this as translation is another annotation inside the bigger one. Basically, this is the annotation equivalent of the T function in uh, Because we can't, we're in a comment, we can't call code. But this lets us parse it and translate it anyway. Um, and as you see here, this is the actual class. So you keep both the metadata and the logic together. Um, just gives you a great overview. Um, this is YAML discovery. The red is also not very readable. Right. So you can you see there's no class here. There's nothing. Um, you see the plugin IDs are these keys here at the beginning, and these arrays are basically the equivalents of the arrays we saw in the annotations. There's no class because the plugin manager automatically sets a default class on these things. And these are, uh, these are menu links, yes. Um, so if you build a site in Drupal 8 and you want to add a menu link, just create a um, modulane.links.menu.yaml file and add one of these. And you have a menu link because menu links are plugins in Drupal 8. Um, it's really easy, it's really readable um, because you don't have to have any logic. Um, someone who doesn't know any PHP can very easily write this. Um, some of the functionality that plugins can provide is forms. They can provide their own form. And if you have a plugin type that requires multiple forms to be provided by plugins, this doesn't work. You have to figure out something else. But there is an interface, which is plugin form interface, which basically has the three methods we're used to when dealing with forms. Build, validate, and submit. So it has build form, validate form, submit form. And combined with plugin configuration, what you can do is use this interface to display a form when you're configuring the plugin. The submit form just stores all the values inside the plugin's configuration, so you don't redirect because all these forms are embedded into a bigger parent form, so you're not, you're not allowed to do any redirect stuff. But you save it into the plugin's configuration, and then using the get configuration method, you just export the plugin's configuration, you store it somewhere, and you reuse it later to recreate the plugin. Um, this is a really, really cool part. Also a really, really complex part. What we've seen now is that when we want to have a new plugin, we have to write a little bit of code, YAML, or annotated classes, for every plugin we want. But there are quite a few situations in which you don't know which plugins you want to define. Or you don't know the number, uh, you, or like you want to do it dynamically, because 
we can create menu links in the user interface. And we don't, we can't, if we point and click, we can't add a plugin definition on file. Um, or for every menu we have, we want a block. You know, we have a few default menus, but we can also create these menus on the fly in the user interface. So we want to dynamically create plugins. And that's where derivatives come in. Well, you see the description there. What you do is you create one base plugin, and you define for this base plugin a derivative, which creates derivatives. Um, basically, if you have you know, like parent-child kind of thing, because every child is a derivative of its parents. It's based on its parents. Um, and this deriver can do any number of things, but a very simple example in the case of block plugin or menu blocks is the deriver is a simple class that only accepts the menu storage. And then it goes through the menu storage and it asks it, which menus do we have in the system? And then for every menu it loops through it, it creates a new plugin definition in PHP that replaces this base plugin definition. But they can use the same class if you want. You can also specify an overwrite class. So the base plugin definition is automatically always replaced when you have derivatives. So if we have five menus in the site, the deriver loops through these five menus and creates a new plugin definition for these blocks. So it's like a new block plugin definition for every menu. And bam! Without having to write code for any of these menus, we automatically have the definitions for all of them as blocks. A little bit of code ahead. Um, after the slides, we'll do a little bit of live coding. So this is amazing. This is really, really cool stuff in Core because it's consistent. It makes it easy. If you write a custom plugin type or you write a custom plugin type, I can easily work with that because we use the same API for discovery and factory. Yeah. So there's a lot less custom stuff to understand, which saves everybody a ton of time. Um, also, because it's all a consistent API, you can build stuff that works with all of these regardless of its type. And that's partly what the plugin module does. It's a contribute module, um, like the entity module in Drupal 7, improves the core entity API. The plugin module in Drupal 8 improves the core plugin system. And as I said before, there's no way in core to discover which plugin types are available. And once you know the plugin type, and you have the plugin manager, you can figure out automatically which plugins are available at this time but then you have to know the plugin type and you have to hard code that in your code. But what if you want to do a build functionality that works with any plugin type, with blocks or fan types or image style or whatever you want? That's what this does. Um, every module that can have a little YAML file that basically exposes its plugin type. Like, oh, this is the name, um, human readable oh, ID, human readable name, and this is, the this is how you can get the plugin manager. And uh, the plugin module exposes that. Um, and then you can easily loop through all the plugin types. For every plugin type, you have the manager, you go through the plugin discovery and definitions, and you can basically, using this, create any plugin that is available in the system. Um, and because we're using that API, we now know which plugin types we have. We have a very nice little administrative overview in the module that basically shows you a list of all the plugin types in the core, and then for every plugin type, it shows you which plugins are available. Um, which was nice and surprising, because when I built this, um, I had no idea we had so many plugin types in the core. It's good to create a bit more understanding of the system that you're working on. So maybe you've heard about CMI, or the Configuration Management Initiative in Drupal 8. Basically, we store configuration in YAML files um, instead of the database, which is cool for a couple of reasons. Most importantly, we can throw in Git, so we can version our configuration. So if someone screws up and changes the configuration of the life cycle, git diff, oh man, what did you do? It's changed. Um, but because it's only YAML, we kind of, you know, I want to translate all these things uh, because multilingual is really cool and it has expanded all over the system in Drupal 8. We need metadata. And we provide this configuration metadata in Drupal 8 using configuration schemas. We describe the structure of the configuration YAML files and we add some metadata to say, oh, this is a piece of text, this is just like a, st a string, or this is a translatable string, or this is a long piece of translatable text, which basically means that if we store anything and we get our schema right, then using the config translation UI, it just picks up the schema. It's like, oh, yeah, you have, of this particular type of configuration, you have multiple bits of configuration, and they're all translatable. Here's a UI to, using the interface, translate all these configuration strings. 
Um, and that can range from the website title, like on the, the system information page, to uh, the translation of fields that you created. Like, uh, they have a human readable name, so you can translate them in the, in the same way. But as you know, if we go back a little, we could import and export plugin configuration out of the plugin instances using the get configuration and set configuration methods. I said we can store them in file somewhere to recreate them later. Because we have an instance in an admin page. We configure it, the plugin, how it works using the plugin form. And then we want to save that so when a user visits our site and we need this, this plugin, we can recreate it using the configuration we inserted to the admin panel and back. But if this per, uh, configuration must be translated because it contains some text, we need schemas. So there's no standard for this in core. It's all messed up. Uh, the schemas exist only for a few plugin types in core. They have unpredictable names. So if, again, if you want to work with all kinds of plugin types at the same time, there's no way to do that in core. So this is how we name the plugin schemas with fallbacks in the plugin module, and it's reliable. If you follow this convention, this is the plugin type ID, which would be block or field underscore type. And this is the plugin ID, maybe it's like system search block. Um, it works. Uh, I wrote some code a while ago that lets you store plugin instances in fields. But yeah, fields have default values, so the plugin instance configuration is stored as the default value of the field in configuration. And I wanted to translate that. So, um, using this convention, um, the asterisks are actually official CMI fallback signs, so like wildcards. Um, and there is a schema for this that basically says the configuration can be anything and is untranslatable. So you can override it, but if you don't, you don't get translation, but it also won't fail. Um, if you don't get it, don't worry. Just remember it for when you work with it and do some CMI stuff. Um, another thing is that the plugin definitions are arrays. Uh, the really cool thing about arrays is that they're really easy. The really bad thing about arrays is also that they're really easy. You can't do anything with them. They're lists. Um, there's no way to distinguish one array key from another. Basically, the ID key from the label key. You don't know that one of them should be translatable. Um, and one of the things in core is that most plugins have a label key for the human readable label, except for blocks, which have admin label. Try working around that in the universal way. So, um, actually, we recently changed this. Um, there are plugin definitions objects in the plugin module. Um, there are even decorators that take the original array definitions and uh, provide you with an object which has a method. It has a get label method. And whatever plugin definition you, get, you give it, you can extract a human readable label. Um, like with the discovery and the factory, these are interfaces with predefined methods. So basically, if you get one of these objects, there's all, you always get the human readable label in the same way using the get label method regardless of what it does internally. Um, so we're trying to get this into core at some point, maybe Drupal 9, maybe 8.1. Um, but this is one of the most important things to make everything universal if you want to work with multiple plugin types. Uh, this one's really awesome because you can configure plugins through the UI using plugin forms. Yeah. Uh, again, this is from the point of view where you want to build a system that works with any kind of plugin type. For instance, uh, maintain the payment module, when you select a payment method, a payment method is a plugin. Um, you want to select it and configure it through the user interface in your checkout screen. Um, we might be using it for rules, because when you want to create a rules condition or action, um, you select a plugin, because these are also plugins, and it has its own configuration form. Um, there's a lot of form API magic involved with this. You don't want to rebuild it for every application. You don't want to rebuild it for every um, plugin type. So plugin selectors are also plugins, but they allow you to select plugins of any type. You give it a plugin type um, and a plugin discovery, which might be retrieved from the plugin type. And then it just gives the user an overview of the available plugins. And if the plugin defines itself as configurable with a form, it will display the form once the user selected it. Um, this, this is hundreds of thousands of lines of complex form API code that you don't have to write anymore. Um, I already mentioned we can store plugin instances in fields. It's a bit of an inception because fields are also plugins, and fields are on entities which are sort of technically also plugins. Um, one of the examples is that um, I started writing payments. Payments are content entities. Payments have payment methods on them, and payment statuses, and these are plugins. 
And at some point, the entity system became so complex that everything had to be filled. If you want to store anything on a cloud entity, it must be filled. So, all right, let's write some code to store these plugin instances on fields uh, or in fields. Um, so there's a field type for that. But the field type doesn't provide a user interface. That's what the widgets are for. But we already had a user interface for selecting and configuring plugin instances. We had the plugin selectors that provide these. So using a tiny bit of code, we expose every single plugin selector in the system as a field widget for these field types. It's like 20 lines of code, and it works. It's really cool. We have a really basic formatter just displays the label. We have a specific block formatter which renders the block also 10 lines of code. Um, and this is really cool stuff to play with. Um, the moment you install the plugin module, um, all the known plugin types in the system and the plugin module exposes all course plugins itself can be used as field types, except for field type plugins and entities. You can't use those. They have been hard coded, like do not use these as contents for field types. Um, or something the box. And the moment you write your own module with the YAML file in which you expose your plugin types, like, I don't know, maybe you want to make a cookie factory website and you have cookie plugins, um, and you expose those, bam, the whole system automatically makes them available to put into fields. So this is really awesome stuff. I can hear the cogs turning your heads. It's really complex stuff. Don't worry if you don't get it. Like I said, with the derivatives, it's really abstract. It's really, um, it's one of these things that you need to work with it before you fully grasp how much easier this makes our lives. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of live coding. Uh, I'm going to write a block plugin, and I'm going to show you how the system block derivative works. Um, yeah, I'm going to show you this after the live coding. All right, this is my code editor, and the resolution is really low. Is all right, so, yes. Let's go to the um, system. Can you change the color, color theme? Just the color theme. You want the light one? Yeah. yeah. I just changed it a while ago. Um, it's the default, right? Thank you. Oh, this is a lot better. All right, cool. Um, for anyone who doesn't know this, this is PHP Storm. It's a really awesome editor. I don't work for it, but I um, can highly recommend you trying this out if you haven't worked with AAA yet, because of all the files and classes, it makes navigating through them a lot more easy. Um, so this is a block. And as you can see, there's an annotation here, which has the method um, you know, ID, the label, as you can see, it has the admin label key, the, the dreaded admin label key, as opposed to just label. Um, but we have multiple menus of the system and we want to block for every single one of them. So we have a deriver here, uh, which is basically the name of the class. And all these slashes and stuff in there, it's called namespaces. It's PHP 5.3, if you're curious. Um, basically, it's the path to the class in the system. Um, so this is all the logic for any block, but it doesn't actually provide the definitions that we need. That's what the deriver class does. So we're going to look that up. Um, that's this one. I need to close this before. Yeah. Um, this is all the code. This is all the code that you need to create dynamic block definitions based on menus. Um, so the create method is this is just a factory pattern. This is um, also a factory pattern, look it up. Um, so these two methods are used to create a new instance of this thing. And as you can see, it just gets the menu storage and it gets it through the entity manager. It's service definitions. Um, it's not specific to plugins, so just look this up. Um, but it gets this, it depends on that. And then this is the little bit of code that actually provides the definitions. It just loops through the available menus and then creates these definitions. As you can see here, it reuses the base plugin definition. So that's that's the part that we saw in the annotation in the other class with the name and all that. Um, and it changes the label, it adds some configuration dependencies, and using this key, it just changes the idea of the plugin, really. Um, and as we know, plugin definitions are injected into the plugin classes. So, um, and plugin IDs are injected as well. So once a menu block class gets this definition, it also has the ID which contains the menu name, so it knows what menu to display. Um, so this is a really 
small bit of code that we can use to dynamically create, create definitions and save ourselves a lot of trouble. You can even use this if you know the exact, you know you have 200 definitions, you know, and it's never gonna change, never, ever. Um, but typing 200 definitions is a lot of work. You can even use this approach to just make sure you don't have to write as much code. Um, so let's actually, um, so Firefox, third browser, lots of tabs, yes. Um, let's actually um, create a block. See how it goes. Uh, blocks are annotated classes, so we're gonna write the annotation. This is a fresh Drupal 8 install that I just created right before this presentation. So if it breaks, I blame everyone who's provided patches in the past few days, including you, Laudi. Um, so actually, now we have the topic for this block. Laudi crashed or broke Drupal core. Yeah? We're going to create a block for that. We're going to bl blame the Laudi block, basically. Um, you need to figure out something, right, for an example. So this is the new block page. Uh, looks a little different from the one in Drupal 7. If you haven't seen this one, uh, yeah, yeah, and we're going to see, this is, these are the blocks that we have available. As you can see, there's no block about Laudi anywhere in this list, but we're going to add one. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create, congratulations, I installed Drupal. So I'm going to, of course, create a new class file. I'm very old fashioned, why does it look, what? where am I? Or, yeah, there's modules. Uh, I'm just going to use the system um, block for this. Plugin, log, yeah. Uh, Lowry block. Okay. So I wanted to touch. Yes. All right. Um, so we create the file and we start coding. Uh, namespace is important, especially when making typos. Uh, so this is like the path to the file. We can have multiple blocks. If you don't know namespaces, you can have multiple classes with the same name in the system as long as your namespace is different. It's kind of like a directory structure without the directory structure. Um, so we have Drupal system plugin plugin lock. All right, and we create a loading block. Um, so because blocks have a bunch of functionality, like most plugins. That's why most plugin types have base classes. So we're going to extend the, uh, I think this is the plugin base class, yes. Um, so this gives us the base functionality that we need. Uh, but we also need um, the annotation itself. Uh, and I have to, act, to be honest, um, take a little peek. Uh, right, um, I'm just gonna copy this because I'm really, really lazy. Um, change everything that's in there. I have thick fingers and can't press the right keys. But this is the system loading block. And like with anything, plugin IDs are injected into another system. So you have to make sure that you don't get any collisions between plugin IDs. So as the same thing as we used to have with hooks, prefix everything with the name of the module that this plugin belongs to. Uh, now I hack, I'm hacking the system module, as you can see up here. Uh, don't ever do that. Um, so I need to prefix it with the system uh, name. Um, Lowry broke core. Again, um, in all honesty, he breaks core, I usually break the test box, so we kind of complement each other. Um, one of the things that we need to prevent, uh, provide still is a build method. As you can see here, this is PHP, so I'm telling you that I screwed up, that I'm not done yet. And the build method um, basically provides a renderer of this particular um, block. And this is the block inter uh, the interface for block plugins, and as you can see, there are no bodies for the methods. You just have the, the definition. Uh, this one actually has parameters, um, this method. But they don't actually do anything. You know, you've got the dot block, you've got the name, you've got the parameters. It tells you what kind of data to return. Uh, in this case, it is a Boolean or an access result interface. Um, but that's it. Because we want to know you know the, the expression, if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, it probably is a duck? Well, that's kind of this. Like, we, have, we can have a duck interface, and every, everything that implements that interface is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, maybe I am not a duck, but I can, you know, I can act like a duck. I can, I can walk, I can walk. For all intents and purposes, I'm a duck. Maybe I'm also a dog. Maybe I also implement dog interface, which has a bark method and a wag my tail method. Maybe I can be both. 
that doesn't matter. Um, so if we look at the, the documentation of the build method here, um, we need to return the renderer array, also defined in you know, at the app return annotation. Um, and how we build this renderable array, the interface doesn't care. We can, we can have a hard-coded render array, we can have a dynamically generated render array. Um, it is completely irrelevant for the calling code because the calling code just wants you to give, you give it a goddamn render array. And like, I don't care how you do it, just give it to me. So, we are going to, I'm going to be really, really nasty here. Uh, this is not how you create a proper render array. But still, um, I'll already broke Drupal 8 again. Oh no, kittens, go here. Okay, um, this is good PHP code. We have created a block. If it doesn't do much except yell at a particular person, um, but it's a block, it'll work. Um, because we use the basic class, we have all the basic stuff, like uh, what does it do? Uh, oh, it creates a label, which it gets from the plugin definition, as we can see here. Um, here we can see, that the definition that we inject into a plugin class is actually used or can be used. Um, now, this is you know, the configuration, import, export, these methods. So it, the base class does a lot of things for us. It doesn't really need to change for any particular block plugin implementation. So now we have this, and well, we need to tell Drupal to figure out that it has a new block, so we're just going to wipe its caches. Um, apparently, I need to change my directory permissions. And we are going to reload this list. Because we, create, we, we, um, we cleared the caches, which means that all the direct the discovery methods, most of them actually cache the definitions they find, because going through the files, parsing the annotations and all that is quite expensive, especially if you need it in every page, until we cache it. Um, we wipe it, and here it is. We're going to plaster this all over our front page. Um, I clicked the header, so we're going to place this in the header, and we're like, yes, everybody loud it. And as you can see, we have these vertical tabs down here with uh, block configuration. We didn't actually write it because this is all provided by the, base, uh, the, the block plugin base class. So we're going to save it and go to our front page, which is called back to site. And ah, everybody will now know what Laudi did. So this is how you create a plugin. Um, let me show you the menu links. Yeah, Yamaha. Um, I already showed you a small snippet of it in my slides. Um, we can just add a new link here. Um, we don't have many anymore. We have a routing system, so um, we have to specify which route it points to, and every route has a path, yada, yada. Um, this is basically you want to add a new link, you create a custom object with a file like this. Um, and, but there's no class, so what we can do is go to the plugin manager for these plugins and see what it does. And you see here, these are the defaults that it merges in. This is not part of the actual plugin system API. This is just how menu links work. And you can see here, huh, it just uses a default class. But this is a, an array with defaults. And if you merge in uh, an array with default values into an existing array, if the existing array already contains the key, it's not overwritten. Which means that if you specify any of these keys in your menu link definition in the YAML file, they will not be overridden by these defaults, which means that you can set your custom class. If you do want your menu link to have its own functionality, its own logic, you can specify a class key like this in your file here. Let's do that down. Back. But I will leave the version. So now this particular menu link uses the other class, the one that we specified, all the other ones to use the default. Again, as you can imagine, you don't usually want to do this, which is why we don't have the object of class discovery and we don't have to specify our own class all the time. All right, let's go back to my slides. It has never been easier. It's new, it's great, it takes a bit of getting used to. Once you are used to it, it makes your life so much easier. It makes working together with other plugin type developers a lot easier. Um, this presentation will be uploaded to SlideShare, um, the plugin module. If you want to uh, play around with it, and it does a lot of things out of the box, so you can. Um, it's over there. Again, this is me if you want to stop. Do you have any questions? Loud. You see, uh, I have a, actually, I have a 
Thank you. 